Thomas will be our third and last speaker of this session. As a first year, he dove right into our group and became one of our small group leaders. So I was very grateful to have him leading us. And so something I've noticed is usually you'll see him with a clipboard and pencil. Um, at first you're like wondering, is he sketching or is he like into art? Um, whether it's like we're on a car ride to a retreat or even on a hike, he'll be holding not a water bottle, but a clipboard and a pencil. And turns out it's not to sketch, as now a second year in mathematics, he's always ready to jot down any ideas that hit him. So he's super ready for any of those brilliant God bringing ideas so he can get them down for uh, the numbers he works out. And something that we found really funny uh, in our small group was the time we saw him most excited, the most excited we've ever seen him was when he met someone studying number theory. So once it was revealed, oh, what are you studying? Number theory, he, he, was, he had the biggest smile, the biggest excitement. So that tells you uh, the things he's excited about. Um, but yeah, usually you don't see like as much excitement or the, that pure joy, but number theory, someone studying number theory will set him off. <laughs> so let's welcome Thomas and he'll be sharing about some abstract math with us. Oh, thank you. Yeah, so is yes, yeah, so I do kind of you know, I'm just in my first year of PhD that I'm going into kind of abstract math and I guess the kind of purpose of my talk is kind of oh yeah, Beaver, yeah. This is the uh, this is the math version of PowerPoint. Um, so yeah, I'll be talking about kind of what's the point of doing this abstract math, kind of why do it, particularly as questions. So but to start off, I'll kind of start off at a in a weird kind of place. So there was this guy called Martin Gardner, and he wrote this long kind of long running column in the Scientific American called Mathematical Games. And what it was, it was a, it was a way of kind of presenting kind of mathematics to a fairly lay audience, but he, he covered some fairly sophisticated stuff, but at a level that a lay audience could understand. He had a lot of kind of communication with Kind of real professional mathematicians and kind of trying to communicate some of those ideas to a lay audience. Um, so if you've heard of things like Conway's Game of Life or hexaflexagons or various kind of mathematical games or puzzles, he kind of had a kind of significant role in introducing them to a wide audience. So he had this kind of long-running column in the Scientific American and one of his columns was this column on April 1st, 1975, where he published a column with uh, apparently six major discoveries of 1974 that for one reason or another were in inadequately reported to the scientific communi community and the public at large. So, and if you kind of glance through this list, what you might notice is this is actually an April Fool's joke. This was the only April Fool's joke he pulled, but it was a fairly kind of well thought out April Fool's joke. So basically Martin Gardner was presenting six kind of academic-ish hoaxes that at the time kind of might have fooled some of his readers. So the first one was, uh, this is one of the more mathematical ones. There was this uh, long-standing conjecture called the four-color, what he calls a four-color map conjecture, but now we know it's actually true. But at the time it was unknown whether every map could be colored with four colors so that neighboring colors look different. Because of course on a map, if you want to kind of distinguish the countries, you want to be able to color the adjacent countries different colors. So at the time it was unknown whether you could always do this. And Martin and Gardner, claimed that a mathematician had found a map that couldn't be colored with four colors. And some of his readers were pretty kind of avid fans of this stuff, and a fair number of them tried their hand at this and kind of tried, oh, could it really not be colored with four colors? And apparently there were thousands of readers who managed to kind of find the, because it is actually true that every map can be colored with four colors, it wasn't known at the time, but apparently there were thousands of readers who kind of gave a shot at it and were a little frustrated with Martin Gardner for, uh, pulling the leg and giving a math that could actually be colored with four colors. So this is fairly tricky to do, but it is doable if you have a few days time to try various possibilities. So that was the first hoax. Uh, the second one was this hoax where he claimed that uh, e to the pi times root 163 happened to be exactly an integer. And if you know anything about e and pi, this should strike you as a little strange because e and pi is supposed to be random. 
Uh, but the weird thing about this one is that if you computed this number to 12 decimal points, which, and remember this is 1975, that would be pretty hard to do without a computer and specialized software. If you computed this number to 12 decimal, decimal points, then, oh yeah, not, I guess e, e and pi are not random, the turbulent, I guess, yeah. But if you compute this number to 12 decimal points, what you see is you get a, you get a string of, ni of 12 nines. So this number, if you computed it that far, it would actually look pretty convincing that maybe it actually is an integer and there's just some rounding error going on in the computer. So this was the second hoax. It's actually not an integer, as you might expect, but especially in 1975, you couldn't just plug it into Wolfram Alpha, so this would be a fairly convincing hoax. The uh, third one is basically a kind of, Martin Gardner claimed that there was this self-playing computer program that played itself a lot of times, got really good at chess, and managed to establish that this first move in chess is a win for, win for the first player. And if you know anything about chess, you'll know that this is actually an awful move for the first player. If there's nothing you want to do, it doesn't control the center, it doesn't develop your pieces. Uh, but at the time, people didn't really understand computers and machine learning wasn't really a thing. So who knows, maybe there was a computer program that had managed to get really, really good at chess, well beyond human ability, and had managed to find that this was actually a good first move. Uh, the next one was this apparent logical flaw in special relativity. And I don't know much about special relativity, but this is a, apparently a kind of a actually a well-known thought experiment. It doesn't actually disprove special relativity, but you have to kind of think about it in the right way. I think the reason why this is subtle is because in special relativity, there's this notion of events occurring simultaneously that is kind of tricky to get right. But if you, if you know special relativity and kind of what it means for events to be simultaneous, this actually doesn't disprove special relativity. It's just an interesting thought experiment. But if you're interested, you can look it up. It's called the ladder paradox. I think it has a Wikipedia page. And then the last two are also kind of interesting. Uh, this one was just kind of a, one of the more humorous ones. Apparently there was this long lost page from Leonardo da Vinci demonstrating that he was the illustrator, but uh, he was the inventor of the valve flush toilet. So there's this humorous picture of da Vinci on a valve flush toilet. And I think this was done by someone fairly professional. Uh, this isn't actually real, but it looks pretty convincing. And then the last one, it's one of these physics ones where it doesn't look like it's one of these things you can build where it has some movements and you can't quite figure out where they're coming from. And apparently they're coming from psi energy, but really they're coming from kind of slight air currents that push this kind of thing around. So those were the six hoaxes. And most of these, I mean, they're kind of cute and funny, but I don't find them terribly interesting from a mathematical perspective. Like even the first one, which is fairly mathematical, I don't find it terribly interesting because sure it's just a map that's really hard to color with four colors, but it's not special in any way. But the second example is an example that I find really interesting because as I said, it's like really, really close to an integer, even though it's not. And that's kind of surprising. Like if you want to think about this randomly, if you pick a random number, the probability that it's this close to an integer without actually being an integer is like one in a trillion, which is incredibly unlikely. If you think about like the lotteries and all these really unlikely things, this is kind of significantly more unlikely than those. So this is not something you'd expect to see at all. And it's especially unlikely considering it's a fairly simple number that we're looking at. It doesn't look terribly contrived. So this is the one I want to kind of focus on. The other interesting about it, thing about it that Martin Gardner didn't mention is that there's actually other examples. So if you kind of change the 163 to a 67 or a 43, you get other examples of numbers that are really close to integers. So here's one that's kind of one in 4,000 away from an integer. Here's one that's one in seven million. And then you have the one in a trillion uh, example. And I guess uh, the reason why this is interesting, I'm getting feedback somewhere, but the reason why this is interesting is because I guess E and pi are supposed to be random, or maybe I should say turbulent. They're supposed to be unpredictable. So it's kind of strange that you should see these sorts of patterns appearing. Okay, so I want to take a kind of a brief digression. Remember these numbers, but I'll come back to them. So the other kind of part of this is these, these things called prime numbers, which you might have heard of, the numbers that can't be broken down under multiplication. So 23 is prime, 21 is not prime. And I'm a number theorist. I really love prime numbers. And in general, mathematicians, we really love prime numbers.
And we love to find different numbers. It's like a random formula, like n squared minus n plus 43. If you kind of check whether the numbers it produces are prime, it's a bit hit or miss because the prime numbers are unpredictable. Sometimes you get lucky and it's prime. Sometimes you get unlucky and it's not prime. You can't say for certain. But there's this really weird example by uh, Leonard Euler, where there's this polynomial, this kind of n squared minus n plus 41, and it happens to produce a string of 40 primes in a row. And this is really surprising. If you use some kind of naive probability, uh, just kind of assuming these things are independently, kind of all these kind of things are independent events, this ends up being like a one in a nonillion chance, one in 10 to the 30. Now this isn't quite right. Uh, I know there's mathematicians here who will pull me out on this because these aren't actually independent. But if you use some naive models, this is a very, very unlikely event. And even with more sophisticated methods, this is still incredibly unlikely. So this is another example of a very surprising kind of mathematical coincidence, or at least what seems to be a coincidence. And just like before, there's actually other smaller examples as well. So there's this crazy string of 40 primes, but there's also a string of 16 primes and a string of 10 primes. And these are kind of various examples of this phenomenon. So it seems a little too, uh, too simple to be just a coincidence. And in fact, these two examples that I've shown are actually have this weird relationship between them. There's this string of primes, uh, unlikely string of primes example, and this uh, number being very close to an integer example. And there's actually this kind of correspondence between them. If you remember these numbers, 43, 67, 163, and if you compare them with the numbers 11, 17, and 41, what you might notice is that if you multiply these ones by four and subtract one, you get the numbers on the right. So there's, we see, there seem to be these two kind of different types of weird mathematical coincidences that are going in line with each other. And this, this should be kind of very, very surprising. And in fact, there is actually, this is not a coincidence. There's actually some deep mathematics that's explaining why these things are happening. There's a deep connection between getting this long string of primes and getting this almost integer. And the kind of connection between them is what's known as this theory of complex multiplication. And I've got this lovely quote here uh, from a mathematician, David Hilbert, who says that the theory of complex multiplication is not only the most beautiful part of mathematics, but also of the whole of science. So this is a really lovely quote for me as a mathematician, although perhaps David Hilbert's not an unbiased observer because he is a mathematician himself. But this is a very beautiful theory, as you can see, it connects to a very interesting phenomenon in mathematics. Now, I'd love to go on a kind of big lecture about complex multiplication, but the problem is that it's actually a very complicated subject. And in fact, I barely know it myself. And in fact, understanding it fully requires several years of specialized graduate level mathematics really kind of aiming towards it. You've got to take some kind of basic, oh, you've got to have a well-rounded kind of first year graduate understanding of mathematics and then some specialized courses beyond that. And even some stuff that's not usually taught in courses that you just have to find in some obscure book. So this is a really deep subject that requires a lot of knowledge of abstract mathematics to understand. And that's kind of where I want to leave the kind of mathematical portion of it is this example where you've got kind of some really deep kind of beautiful thing in mathematics that uh, understanding and appreciating the beauty requires a knowledge of a deep knowledge of abstract mathematics. So now kind of I'll move to the theological portion. So there is kind of real beauty in mathematics and there's this kind of parallel between the natural world and also the mathematical world and that the mathematical world does have real beauty that we can explore and understand. And discovering this beauty, I think it does bring glory to God and it also reveals some of the characteristics of God. Seeing these cool coincidences and lovely things in mathematics can maybe kind of help you understand and appreciate kind of God's ingenuity and sense of humor. But the interesting thing about kind of this example I just showed is that some of these, some of this beauty in mathematics requires a kind of deep knowledge of mathematics. And I think this is why, at least to me, abstract mathematics is worthwhile, because it allows me to understand some deep kind of aspects of God's creation that I couldn't otherwise understand. So there's some deep stuff in God's creation that you really have to know your field in order to be able to fully appreciate and understand. Now, there is a danger to abstract mathematics, which is that it seems to be kind of accumulating knowledge for knowledge's sake, which is kind of you're proving a theorem, proving a theorem, and it's just kind of accumulation of knowledge, and it idolizes 
human intellectual achievement. And I think this is a real danger, I think particularly in mathematics, but also in the rest of science. In mathematics, especially, if you prove a really good theorem, you get your name attached to it. Uh, if you've taken calculus, you might have heard of Taylor's theorem, where some person proved a theorem and the name's attached to it. And this is kind of a little dangerous as Christians, because what it does is it places our identity in the work that we do. And that's a dangerous sort of thing. So I think for us as Christians, particularly in academia, we need to kind of hold a different perspective. So first of all, the discoveries that we make, they don't bring, bring glory to ourselves or to kind of human intellectual achievement. The discoveries that we make, they bring glory to God and the beauty that we reveal brings glory to God. And in fact, the reason why we're even able to make these discoveries and appreciate uh, the beauty that God has created is a manifestation of who we are. Uh, kind of regular animals, they can't appreciate beauty in God's creation, but we can. And I think that's kind of a manifestation of who we are created in the image of God. And our identity uh, as kind of being made in the image of God, it comes from God. Our identity does not come from the academic work that we do and the intellectual discoveries that we make. So that's where I want to end it. And here are some kind of questions to think about. <laughs>